Tonight on this episode of Veterans Voices, we'll be talking with some extraordinary women who served their country in combat zones. We'll also hear from Dr. Felisa Gaffney, a readjustment counselor at the Concord Vet Center, to talk about some of the unique needs of women veterans. We're glad you're here with us. If you're online, please share this broadcast with others. We'll be right back with our first guests. Welcome. I'm Nathan Johnson, the Contra Costa County Veterans Service Officer, and I'm joined by my co-host and Gold Star Father, Kevin Graves. Thank you, Nathan. Thank it's, Kevin. it's great to be here. Good to see you. The mission of Veterans Voices is to serve the community by sharing and discussing veterans issues and connecting vets and their families to resources. If you're watching tonight and would like to share something or ask a question, please call us at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open and we encourage you to call in. We need you to participate in this conversation. Tonight's conversation in particular is historical. It's very important. You can also send us an email at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org or connect with us on Facebook at Veterans Voices One. The portrait that you are seeing was presented to me by my son's unit five months after he was killed. The commandant invited my wife and I to go back to Fort Hood to meet with the rest of the soldiers of the 110th MP Company. I was given the opportunity to address his battle buddies on the parade field to tell them how proud I was of Joey and how proud I was of all of them. After they had received all of their awards, there was a reception to honor Joey and his family, and I was presented with this portrait. It is signed by the soldiers of the gauntlet, the soldiers of the 89th MP Brigade, and hangs prominently in our home. Now we'd like to welcome our guests, Tony Chio, Kristen Cassidy, and Ashley Bao. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to have all you guys here today. Thank so we're going to talk about women in combat tonight, which is a topic I'm very excited to cover. But before we dive into your unique experiences, tell us a little bit about your military service. Tony? Um, I, was, I joined in 1983. Um, after having to fit with my parents, decided to just go ahead and join in open contract, 1983 to 1986 in the Marine Corps, and got out of the Marine Corps, joined the Army, and then back into the Marine Corps because I missed it so much. <laughs> and when, 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 we, when did you finally separate? 96. 96. Mm -hmm. I and swear. during that time, you had mentioned earlier that during Desert Storm, you were in Turkey. That's right. We were in Turkey, and right, uh, right when we got there, we had been there, I think, a couple of nights, and they said, okay, we're, you're going. Then all of a sudden, we got a phone call. You guys are going back home. Turn around. And you were... It was over. What was your job in the Marine Corps? I was a field radio operator. And in the Army, home. you were... I was an uh, electronics engineer. Okay. What is an electronics engineer? I was just actually showing somebody that it's uh, like the TV stations. We build them from the ground up. Okay. And uh, we just work with all the, the wires and the cables and everything starting from the ground Very up. Very neat. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here, Tony. Thank you. Kristen, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I was a Navy corpsman. I joined in 2000 and did two tours in Iraq with the Marines and got out in 2005. And not just a corpsman, but a Fleet Marine Force. Correct. FMF corpsman. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank and you. Ashley, how about your, tell us about your military career. Um, I joined the Marines in 2003, and I was a landing support specialist, and I was in for four years, so three to 07, and I was in Iraq in 2005, uh, February to September in Al-Assad. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. So let's start off, uh, we have lots of time to talk about uh, your your roles in the military, but let's start off with some of your experiences in the military. Um, you went to to Paris Island, which is a, a pretty difficult place, sand fleas and such. But um, let's even start before then. What made you decide to join the military? Well, for me, it was you know the GI Bill. But what was it for you? Um, for me, I had. I actually had gotten in a big fight with my mom. <laughs> and so I moved out of my house and I had $80 in my pocket and I had no job, no car. And so I went down to the recruiting station and um, I thought the Marines looked the sharpest and I wanted to be the best. So <laughs> um, 
there you go, I joined the Marines. And then I, the, all, all the patriotism and all the love for my, my country, I, I learned that kind of afterwards. It's not what kind of brought me into it, but uh, it's definitely something that I, uh, that I am very grateful that I did. Well, what were people's reactions to? What was your family's reaction? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I didn't tell anyone until after I had already sworn in. So, um, because like I said, right. we had gotten in a fight, so we weren't even speaking. But um, my mom's first reaction was, well, don't do the Marines, do the Air Force. They have the best food. <laughs> so, too late for Probably that. But <laughs> um, the rest of my family were like, well, you know, people don't think of like, of women being in the Marines, so mm. they were all kind of surprised that I would even do that. They thought I was crazy, which mm. I probably was kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. What about you, Kristen? What made you join, uh, join the Navy? Uh, I just didn't have a direction I wanted to go into. I was going mm. to DVC and not really enjoying it, and there's a little recruiting area right next to DVC, and I just kind of picked what I thought would be the best for me, and it was the Navy. Yeah. And why, uh, why a corpsman, and why specifically did you want to end up being a FMF corpsman, or was some of that not a choice? Um, some of it was not a choice. <laughs> um, so I've always had the knack for helping people. I've always wanted to help people. My dad would tell you that since birth he knew I'd be a nurse. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking at the jobs that they offered, it seemed natural to become a corpsman. So that's what I did. And um, I got orders to go to Camp Pendleton. I didn't choose it. And um, I went and did my field training at Pendleton and then deployed with the Marines. And it was a great experience. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Navy corpsmen, I think, are very special. I think the three of us here that serve in the Marine Corps know that, that Navy corpsmen are our brothers and sisters. So it's nice to have you here. Thank you. So what about you, Tony? What, what made you want to join the military? What was that? decision like for you and how did people respond to to you telling them that you were going to head into the Marine Corps? Actually I kind of had the same experience as Ashley, almost the same mm -hmm. experience. I, I was um, going Air Force originally. I had gone through the whole ROTC thing. I was going to be a, a air traffic controller and my parents and I got into it. Mm -hmm. So I walked I think it was three miles all the way up to the recruiter's office wow. and the, I said I'm the, whoever's there that's wow. who I'm gonna join I was like I'm not gonna go Air Force and I was just so attitude -y. so <laughs> finally got there I was exhausted and the only recruiter that was there was the Marine Corps and I started looking it's like wow they do look sharp and like they look so good and they, their, their <laughs> uniforms are awesome it's awesome I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna join this one so I went in and I asked him and he says the only thing we have right now is for you to go open contract, we have a uh, field radio operator. Mm. I said, well, okay, um, when do I go? Can you send me right away? Sure, wow. we can send you on Monday, so. Wow, <laughs> when, oh my gosh. When, left on Monday, and. You um, only have months to prepare. Oh, you yeah, had well, days. I had been months to prepare for the Air Force, right. but yeah, uh, years the for the Air Force. Yeah. So then um, I left, and um, my family didn't know until I got there. That, so that phone call that they have you make is really the, uh, an important phone call for some people. Yes. Then. Um, we have an email here, and I want to invite our audience to participate in tonight's topic. We have some absolutely incredible guests, and we'll get to more of their experiences. But we also want to hear from your experiences as well. Maybe you have served in the military yourself. Maybe you have a good question or comment for our guests. Please call in, send us an email, and we have one. For any of the veterans, how many other women were in basic or boot camp with you? So For, for all the veterans, let's hear from you. All women. Yeah. Mine. Well, yeah, in the Marine Corps, um, men and women train separately, so um, it's all women that we train with. Um, my particular platoon, we started out with 80, and we graduated 44, so we lost wow. several along the way. Um, wow. Just couldn't hack it, so. Was that difficult to see that people were dropping out? Did that help motivate you, or did that maybe cause any concern? Um, definitely it was, I mean, I guess motivating. You know, you don't want to be sent home. Um, yeah. I, we didn't really know what the re we, we didn't know as, rec you know, um, recruits what the reason was that anyone was sent away, but I know, like, um, they try to send us in pairs, you know, like with someone from your hometown. So my quote unquote battle buddy, she only lasted a few weeks and she would like cry every night mm. um, to go home. So um, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough. 
I've watched a few videos, and this doesn't certainly give me a real experience, but a few videos of women drill instructors, and they're very intense. They're very intense, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we had one that used to grab us right here by our collars and like throw us on the ground. You could tell who she didn't like that week because you had big scratch marks <laughs> on <laughs> neck. Um, so you're, you're through boot camp, you're now a Marine, you're now a corpsman, and what do you expect is ahead for you at that point? I mean, Desert Storm had not yet maybe kind of surfaced, but Iraq and Afghanistan had probably been happening. Um, so wh what did you expect of the next part of your experience going into the fleet or deploying over overseas? Anything in particular? Um, well, I was uh, sent to Okinawa, Japan, so um, I thought that I wasn't going to get sent to Iraq. I was going to mm. go to the Philippines. I was going to go to, you know, anywhere in Asia, but no, I got sent to Iraq. <laughs> Everybody's being sent to Iraq yes. at that point, so I didn't, yeah. it, the, the choice wasn't. How about for you, Kristen? I certainly did not think that I would ever see war when I joined the military. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was really a possibility. I thought we were not there as a nation. Um, so it was completely by surprise. I remember watching the television all night with my roommate and just saying, we know we're going. Mm -hmm. And it was maybe a day later we got our, our marching orders. Mm. Yeah. I want to interrupt this conversation just for a minute. We have Jerry on the phone from El, Cer uh, El Cerrito or El Sobrante. Sorry if I'm getting that mixed up. Jerry, are you with us? Yes, I am, sir. Oh, uh, thank you, Jerry, for joining us. And do you, do you have a question or a comment? Well, I'm a Vietnam era veteran, well, and um, I was a physical therapy technician. And uh, you know, my experience was kind of different. I also was I was lied to by my recruiter. He told me I was going to Walter Reed Nursing School, and I didn't have a guarantee for school. Hmm. Long story, but I, you know, I ended up being assigned to be a court typist. But then uh, through a series of circumstances, I, uh, I basically sat down in my bunk and said, "I'm not going to do this shit anymore, mm. <laughs> or caca anymore." And uh, and I always um, I I played sports, and so I uh, the commander sent me TDY to uh, for nine. Uh, uh, physical therapy tech, and I had a background and interest. I'd been a nurse's aide, and I was one of those, you know, as a teenager. And you know, I basically drank the Kool Aid. I said, "We're the good guys," and uh, you know, I want to go over there. If Johnny can, you know, die for his country, what can I do? You know, it's all GI Jane. But my experience um, as a medic, working in burn units and stuff, told me, uh, turned me totally against the military. Um, 50 years later, the generals say, oh, we should have never been there. And I have these similar feelings about what these women are going through in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I just wonder how they switch that around or if they ever have. And for me, it was a moment of conscience. I, I thought, I'm using my body. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, I'm only I know I'm only a dot of insignificance, but, you know, my moral conscience was this is all kind of wrong. So I've been involved with Veterans for Peace for over 50 years. Thank you, Jerry, for calling in. I appreciate that you've opened up this conversation to talk about a few more things. And before we get into how your experience has affected you, I'm curious, and again, thank you, Jerry, for calling in. And I invite other members of our audience to participate as well. Were there, this is Jerry who served during the Vietnam era. Were there other women who you could reach out to who were maybe influences in your life uh, to help you prepare for your deployments, um, heading over to Iraq, heading over to Turkey, who did you turn to 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 say, uh, you know, how do I how do I get to this? I don't think it was even a thought at the time. I mean, we were we were young and we were trained, and that was my job, and that's mm. how I were was able to not, uh, I guess, feel the impact of what we were doing, was mm. I was trained and this was my job, okay. and that's what I was doing. You felt prepared? I felt, I felt as prepared as you could be, mm. correct. Do you feel that having another woman to help you understand how to prepare for that situation would have been more helpful or not necessary? I think it would have been helpful. I think they did try to set up, um, you know, somebody who had been over there prior. So they told us, you know, being females, certain grooming things that we would need. Um, 
I mean, honestly, we do have a little special needs every once in a while, so mm -hmm. those were definitely communicated to us. So it's not like we didn't have anybody, mm -hmm. um, but the thought was more of, you know, the things you need and mm -hmm. how to cope and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. It wasn't really with, like deep thought of how you feel about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, those very interesting comments. We're going to come back with another segment in a moment. So thank you for staying with us. Are you out there with your own experiences to share or a question for one of our guests? We encourage you to call in. Be a part of the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. You can call in right now at 925-313-1170. We're also broadcasting on Facebook Live where you can send us a message. Next up, we wanted to highlight the accomplishment of the first female Marine that graduated from the Winter Mountain Leaders Course. Let's watch. Survival. You learn how to survive. You learn how to deal with the cold. Um, I've had frostbite. I've had hypothermia. You know, we, we dealt with all the ins and outs of being up in the mountain and being in the snow, but we learned how to overcome it. I've definitely been through the ringer, you know, being a whole 115 pounds right now and carrying uh, whether it be anywhere from 60 to 95 pound packs and dragging a sled that's good 65 pounds through the snow on skis. Um, it definitely is a challenge to your body. I don't want to say I'm proud of the fact that I was able to accomplish this, but I'm proud of myself. Nobody else needs to be proud of me. I learned what I'm capable of. I learned what I can do and what I can accomplish and nobody can tell me that I can't. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. Thanks for staying with us. We're here with three extraordinary women veterans. We have Kristen, Tony, and Ashley. Thanks uh, for sticking with us as well. And I, I'm curious because I think that a lot of society uh, r believes that women still aren't in combat because for so long we've been said that women don't serve in combat. And I know from the experiences that my son had that he had uh, women in the MPs that served right alongside him and they could have easily been subject to what he was subject to. Uh, so that is combat. When you're being attacked by the insurgents, you're pretty much in combat. So share with us a little bit about um, how you feel about the perception that women aren't serving in combat. Even though your MOSs maybe don't say you're serving in combat, you're still there. Yeah, um, it's not people's first thought to think even of a woman as a veteran, to be honest with you. There's certain telltale signs that a male's a veteran, right? They have the Marine Corps tattoo or the haircut that's very telling that they were in the military. But women, I think it takes a lot of people by surprise when they hear that I'm a combat veteran, that I have combat action ribbons, that I have a medal of valor for my combat distinguishing device. I think that um, it, it allows us also to be slightly invisible, which sometimes comes in handy um, politically. But um, I think that it is something that it, people don't really acknowledge right off the bat. And um, sometimes there's some resistance where they say, you know, you must have been in ancillary services, you must have been a supply clerk, or mm -hmm. something in the back line that was, um, not really f forefront in combat, and that's just not true. Um, we went everywhere our Marines went, including firefights, mortars, those kind of things. Um, I did have an argument one time with a gunny sergeant who didn't want to take me out with EOD uh, because he was expecting a firefight, and he said, you know, you're, you're too pretty to be in a firefight. And um, I took that as a challenge, because that's my personality. Mm -hmm. And I told him that if he didn't take me, he was a fool. I was the best corpsman that they had. Um, and he, I went above him, and I went to the commanding officer, and I told him what was happening. And he said, you know, if you're willing to take the risk, I'm going to stand right beside you. I went out. There was no live fire that day, so it wasn't even an issue at that point. Um, but I think that people really need to acknowledge that we are everywhere the men are right now. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a theme of the past, right? Uh, the women had specific roles. Today, um, we have women who are infantry platoon commanders and women who are driving vehicles up and down the roads and exposed to IEDs. So it's the reality of things. Ashley, you had mentioned earlier in our audience, may I, maybe I had not heard, does there tend to be a minimization of maybe your service in combat and in, in how you feel? Uh, about what you were able to contribute and how you participated in combat? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with what she said. People don't generally, you know, what, example, I have Semper Fi tattooed on my arm and people say, oh, do you have family members in the Marines? Really? Like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, many times. Um, so it's just not, people just don't generally, you know, first think that women are veterans, much less combat veterans. I mean, we have boots in the ground in Iraq, and um, you know we're serving out there alongside the men. What about you? Is it hard to maybe look at yourself and realize that you were in places overseas? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, um, especially like as a mother, I have you know four kids, and I try to hmm. try to remind them sometimes that you know has that women can do everything men can do, but then sometimes you fall into old um, routines. You know, you get into your, your habits of the guys doing this thing and the women doing that particular thing, and mm. um, it's hard to kind of pull that back sometimes. And I think it's also important that, to, uh, to point out the fact that when you sign that document that says, I'm gonna go in, that you don't know where you're gonna go. Mm -hmm. and and, or what you're going to do or what you're going to be confronted with. And just the fact that you vo volunteer to go, let's face it, you're all volunteers, right? Volunteer to go um, means that you're willing to put yourself in that position. And I think that's another thing that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I know guys that have served for 20 years and never seen combat because they just haven't been called up at the right time or when they were either in training for something else or whatever and the circumstances didn't allow it, but they were available to be there. And the fact that you, that, that, that you have volunteered to serve our country means that you're willing to, to do whatever it takes. And that, I think that's what, what really needs to be acknowledged. And thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, what, was the, what was the hardest thing, or what in particular was it very difficult, do you think, um, being in places like Turkey, being overseas, and during a time like Desert Storm, Tony, what was, what was would you say, been the most difficult experience of that? time that I served, it was a long, long time ago, and um, right now it's not, I don't know if now, but uh, maybe about 10 years ago, as it is, a lot of women were not welcomed in the Marine Corps. Mm. When I was in, in the 80s, it was a lot rougher where they, especially when I was in with the infantry, being the only field radio operator female there, um, and 300 and something infantry men. And uh, so it was, I felt like I had to prove myself, although, uh, you know, compared to them, I'm here I am, itty bitty little thing, and then I was 105 soaking wet, yeah. and these I'll big, huge guys. Too. Yeah, yeah uh -huh, radio, right? exactly. It, but I, I always felt like I had to prove myself. When I got out, it's like, and I was kind of like Ashley, too, where you see, you see, you've got that tattoo, I have no tattoos, but if I would tell anybody that I was in the Marine Corps, they're like, you don't look like a Marine. Right. Mm -hmm. What sure. are we supposed to look like? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so I yeah. think. And I think yeah. that's a great segue. So what did that, so that tenacity that you had to learn, that mm -hmm. proving yourself, that rising to the challenge of the other 300 people that were, were, were betting on you not succeeding, right? Exactly. What did that do for you when you came home, when you got out? How did that help you in your, in your life? Well, actually, it, one of the things, the comments that my sisters and, um, and family members used to say is that I was so, I was so competitive and I was not loving like I used to be before. I was just trying to get out there and trying to be the best one and trying to do this and trying to do that, but never the huggy type that I used to be. It, it just made me, I think, harder, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. trying to prove myself all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, did that make it hard to approach people? It did. Yeah. Absolutely. It was just, it, it, I just, I couldn't. It was, it was so different. I mean, I didn't serve in the times that they did, um, mm -hmm. and I wasn't really out there, but it was, it was really hard trying to survive as one of the very few females to be out there with all these men. Mm -hmm. You know, couldn't do anything because always eyes on you. Mm -hmm. At some point, that has transitioned again because now you're a hospice nurse where you spend your life caring for people, being loving to people that are in their, at, at the end of their lives, right? Right. So at some point, it transitioned, you transitioned a little bit away from that uh, and, and, and regained 
maybe some of that approachability that you might have lost? I think so. And one of the main reasons that I wanted to do it mainly was because I, in the military, what they had taught us in the Marine Corps is like, you go out there, you kill, 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 kill if you ever get in combat. And so I was trying to kind of change that a little bit to where I wasn't so hard, so stern, and then I ended up falling in love with it. So I've been doing it for 19, almost 20 years now. That's so. fantastic. To what extent has um, your military experience, you think, shaped your identity with your family? Um, all of you are mothers. And, and so to what extent do you think your children know that you served in the military? <clears throat> your husband actually served in the Marine Corps also, so maybe it's a little bit different for you, um, or maybe it's not. Um, but to what extent do your children know or does your husband or partner recognize or anyone else in your family recognize your service and not only in the military but overseas? My kids are small, they know nothing. My daughter's still confused as to why I'm on TV right now. Um, my husband, who is not military, um, is of course supportive, but I think it's very common for people, soldiers um, who have been in combat to not really talk about it. We don't openly to people who weren't there. I think that's, um, that's common and we do relate more to our brothers and sisters who were there with us, our fellow Marines. Um, so my family doesn't know much. My, they support me of course and um, and would probably listen if I was willing to talk, but I mean, a lot of the stuff wasn't happy stuff, so it's not like something I'm gonna wanna share with my children. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and certainly not when they're young. Correct, yeah. And when they ask the questions that children usually ask, you're gonna probably protect them and... Right, I mean, I'd like to answer as honestly as I can mm. without uh, sparking any fear mm -hmm. or, yeah. or danger thoughts in their yeah. head, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's not something that we talk about on a daily basis, and I think that's kind of normal, yeah. We have someone named Thomas who's, I think, calling in, but uh, we'll continue this until we get him pulled up. Okay, Thomas, we have yeah. Thomas on the phone. Okay, I have the East Coast. That's all I know where you're from, Thomas. So you have a question or comment? I think you served with someone on the panel here. Uh, yes, Kristen Cassidy. Oh. So tell us what's going on. <laughs> Give us the real details we're, we're here, Thomas. We're waiting for this phone call. Taken? <laughs> Go ahead, Thomas. Share with us. Uh, well, I just wanted to thank all the women on the panel today, and especially Doc Lopenberg, which is, uh, that's who she was prior to her marriage, and mm. just how much exactly she hit the nail on the head. Women can have that ability to be invisible with all this strength. And we recognize strength. And when you're in the middle of the combat zone, no one... Oh, hello? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're here. We hear you. <laughs> we're listening intently. Hey, Doc Lopenberg. Hey. <laughs> hey, Harley, how are you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good. good. Um, first, first, let me start off by thanking all you women in experiencing or listening to you now and hearing all your adversities and mountains you have to overcome. However, uh, Kristen, you did speak earlier that it was a benefit to also be invisible, but you show that that strength, you know? Thank and you. What every single woman needs to realize right here, right now, not just veterans, all women in general, is that that their strength is that inner pop, that fire, that passion, that desire to move forward, regardless of your adversities, regardless of the wall, regardless of the branches served at times that they were served in. It doesn't matter because when I look at Doc Lobenberg, hey J Lo. <laughs> um, well, that was our nickname in the field, you know? Thomas, but, um, we have about a minute here, sir. All right, well, well, I guess I can sum it up. Is In the fighting hole, there's no thing as sex, female, male. It's all about passion hmm. to fight for each other no matter what, no matter what, every single day of our lives. 
and we bring that passion and strength to the civilian sector. And if we have to be invisible at some points to get our point across, then that's who we need to be. We're leaders. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thomas, thank you so much for calling in. Appreciate it very much. Wise words. I've, I've been in a fighting hole before, and I, I got to say, I, I second that. I'd probably be in a fighting hole with any of any one of you up here on the stage tonight. <laughs> so um, we have just about 30 seconds, and I will just kind of wrap up this conversation. And, and I think Thomas calling in was really important. To what extent do you stay connected with anyone that you served in in the military? If at all. Um, Aside from my husband, not really um, anyone at all. Okay. Is, is, is there been a particular person? reason? Um, well, when I, you know, when I left the military, I had two newborn children, mm -hmm. and um, and I moved to a place that I had never been before that I didn't know anyone who was from, which is California. So mm -hmm. um, I just lost touch. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier, just that it... Some of the details of your military service have kind of faded away because of a lack of connection to people. Uh, real quickly, Tony, and we have to go to another segment, but have you stayed connected at all with anyone? Obviously, Kristen stayed connected with Thomas, so. <laughs> no, I'm like her too. I just, just lose touch. Just life moved on. Mm -hmm. right, okay. Well, please stay with us. There's more to talk about on this topic. We'll be right back with Dr. Felisa Gaffney. We're now joined by Dr. Felisa Gaffney. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you guys for inviting me again, and it is an honor to sit on this panel with you ladies. Thank yeah. you all for your service. Thank you for your service. Dr. Gaffney, you've been on the show before, but just real quickly, tell us a little bit about your military service. Joined the Air Force in 1987, retired in 2007, two deployments. Well, thank you for being here. So we want to kind of move the conversation more towards what the VA and what our community should know about women veterans, um, and if any of the needs are unique. Uh, Dr. Gaffney is a readjustment counselor at the Vet Center, and so you do one-on-one -on -one and group counseling for, for veterans, not just women veterans, but um, have any of you experienced going to the VA for any type of care? Um, I'm seeing you shaking your head, Ashley, so why don't you start off? Um, okay. Uh, yes, I did. I, I didn't um, really get connected with the VA until several years after I had left. So just about a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, um, I kind of finally, you know, got around to going down there. And I did receive care there from, um, a, you know, doctor's appointments. And um, I got my, like, service-connected um, disability through going through the VA. And so... Um, uh, for me, it was a good experience. I actually, you know, you hear on the news all these negative things, but I, I felt like I was well cared for. It was great being around other veterans again, and I really, um, I really actually enjoyed that. So going into the, and I'm not trying to pick on the VA, but going into the VA, what do you think was the biggest priority for you? Were you, were you most concerned about your physical health? Uh, was it, were you most concerned about your mental health or were you just kind of walking in wondering, I'm not even sure what I need a doctor for at this point? Um, for me, it was my physical health. I had um, injuries that I had sustained um, in Iraq that I had never taken care of. Um, mm. So I dealt with a lot of pain um, for a lot of years. And finally, my husband actually pushed me into, you know, you need to get seen and get this all um, taken care of. So mm. that's what, that was my motivation. Mm. Is that common, Dr. Gaffney? Does a woman veteran typically walk in maybe needing a spouse to support them and kind of guide them, or do they seem to be a little bit more aware or less aware of their needs? So I think it depends. Um, I have some that come immediately, a month after they separate, and then I have ladies like you ladies 
who, oh, it's not as bad, and so you minimize what your experiences were. It wasn't as bad for me as it was for this person, um, and it takes them several years to actually get there. And most of them experience chronic pain. Mm. Um, migraines, chronic pain, in yeah. addition to PTSD and a host of other things. Kristen, how about your experience? Um, I went right away. I think my circumstances were slightly unique. Not only was I fresh out of a combat zone, but I had just lost my mother. So yeah. I felt like I needed therapy um, treatment. Um, so I went immediately upon moving up here and established a therapist. And then, of course, the other things came, the general doctor, that kind of thing. Um, but I can say both my kids were born through the VA system. Mm -hmm. um, they did contract me out to a local hospital mm -hmm. so that I didn't have to drive 30 minutes each way every appointment, which, I mean, it was a beautiful experience for me both times. So I can say that um, for women pregnant, the prenatal care and um, postnatal care is really great through the That's VA, right. yeah. Well, you know, we, we hear that, uh, well, Nathan in the business too, and we hear that a lot, the VHA, the Veteran Health Administration, really, I don't really hear, rarely hear people say anything really bad about that. The care, in fact, I heard Tony Fitzgerald from VA Palo Alto the other day say something like, 65 or 70% of all the doctors in the country are trained in the VA before they go off because, because it's, we're paying for their training. And they're really trained well and they're really good doctors. So I'm glad you guys had a great experience with that. How about you, Tony? Did you, have you, have you been to the, man, are you gonna be a different, are you gonna prove me wrong? <laughs> okay, oops. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. I waited uh, about 20 something years to, to go in and the only reason that I went in is um, I had heard, I was in Camp Lejeune. So uh, it's one of the water contamination sure. uh, marines. And uh, so went in there and uh, was trying to be seen by the doctor and took about five months to see my first doctor, mm. my first appointment. The second time it, after you know they, they got into the whole water contamination thing, it took another six or seven months to get seen again. But that's also in Colorado Springs, so it, it's, it's a lot harder. I think is there's so many, you got four cars in there and all, everybody getting out and then going to the VA, so it's, so not that I'm trying to make excuses mm. you know, for them, but it, it our, our health care was delayed a lot. It should be better than that. Yeah, yeah, and I think part of that had to do with the legislation, the presumptive condition just coming about, and that, that took them a long time to recognize or to admit. Same thing as we have with the Ancient Orange in Vietnam, and hopefully we've learned our lesson when it comes to the burn pits and some of the things that are occurring from, from service in, in the Middle East, uh, that, that we won't take so long to acknowledge the fact that there are presumptive conditions. So we have a question here from Vincent in Martinez. Thank you, Vincent, for, call, uh, for writing in this question. And this is addressed to Dr. Gaffney, but please, anyone on the panel, feel free to address this. And I'll kind of broaden it a little bit. Do women veterans have lower levels of alcoholism? And to broaden that, do women show any less susceptibility or more susceptibility to um, maybe avoidance of you know, their experiences through use of substances like alcohol or any other substance? So I feel like um, it's a two-part answer. One, women experience it less because there are less women who serve in the military. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of that, they're gonna be fewer. Um, women experience PTSD different too, and a lot of it is, um, has avoiding patterns of behavior. I think it depends on what the specific stressor was, um, what you experience. Mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed a lot of is if the trauma is associated to military sexual assault, then you will notice that there's numbing and a lot of high risk taking behaviors and stuff like that. Um, women who have experienced combat or have PTSD related to, to their service in that way experience it a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of what these ladies are doing and kind of minimizing and kind of staying away from the system, don't engage and don't involve, don't like crowds, the typical symptoms that you see for PTSD. Mm. Now, <clears throat> when they, <clears throat> excuse me, when you, when you walk into a, uh, a community, um, do you feel that that community is generally aware of not only the challenges that you face, but also aware of maybe your strengths? Do you feel that 
for example, that you know the news is full of topics like homelessness and PTSD and such. Um, do you feel that the community is generally connected to your experiences and to your needs? I don't think the community even identifies us as mm -hmm. veterans, so how could they be um, aware of our needs. They don't even identify that, that we are veterans and did serve combat or um, those kind of things. So I'd... I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. So what should they know then? Like, so if this is the opportunity then for um, them to understand I think we, needs. I think we went over it, that yes, we are, we are there. We are right there with the men. Um, we do experience PTSD differently. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody who sees combat is going to experience PTSD. Um, I think women have a way of isolating ourselves from the veteran community, whether it's intentional or non-intentional, um, which makes us feel alone and isolated. And um, I just, I have a personal experience with um, one of our Marines who has committed suicide, female Marine. And I just want people to know, women to know that there are others out there and they should reach out and know that they're not alone. Mm. Yeah. Those, are, those are great points and I think it, it, it always comes true whenever we're in a group of veterans or I'm presenting in front of a group of veterans and, and I, or a group and I ask how many people are veterans and so many hands come up and then I ask how many people have served in the military and I get a bunch more hands come up and it's usually the women's hands because a lot of women don't identify as you said as veterans and, and, that, and it's important that it get acknowledged and it's important that we begin to change that, that thinking process, that culture to understand that, that that uh, you don't have to have served in a certain place at a certain time to be, to be a veteran and to be acknowledged and to have the benefits and resources that are available to you as a veteran. And then the other part of that is accepting those benefits and resources, understanding that it's not a zero sum game. It, it, you're not taking benefits from somebody else. They're your benefits, you earned them. You need to make use of them. You know, I really like where this led off, Kristen, and, and we've kind of all been out for a while now. It, time has passed, so what would you say to a woman who is serving in combat today, um, or maybe who is just transitioning out of the military? Um, what kind of advice would you give them, Tony? What kind, of, what kind of recommendations? If you were to mentor them and kind of bring them under your wing, how do you think you would help them? I would just ask them to ask for help before it's too late. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be the main thing. Don't yeah. be listening to all this baloney about what you're a veteran. You mm -hmm. probably didn't do it like she was saying. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing that I hear all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just, who cares what they're saying? Mm -hmm. Please ask for help. Because a, a lot of my uh, Marines have went through a lot of stuff, like, like mm -hmm. her friend that passed away, mine. There are a couple of them that committed suicide as well. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about it. My family doesn't know about it. I, yeah. This is the first time I've actually mentioned mm -hmm. it <laughs> because of the same thing. Yeah. They just don't, they, they don't want to ask for help unless it's, you know, it, I mean, it, it's actually, they never did ask for help and that was the problem, not once. Mm -hmm. But what if they're struggling with, I'm too strong or I'm supposed to be the strong one or I didn't go through what others went through. Ashley, how would you, how would you reach out to them and, and help them in that situation where they're undermining or maybe belittling or, or, or not quite identifying the ways that they need help? Um, well, it's definitely natural to feel like it's almost like a, um, you know, the guilt you feel when someone else gets hurt and you didn't get like the name for that laughs my mind, but um, you know, you almost feel like what you went through wasn't as bad as what someone else went through. You know, I mm -hmm. came back with all my limbs, you know, mm -hmm. my, my story's not, not as important. That's mm -hmm. kind of um, the thought that you get. And I think, first of all, to, to normalize that and say mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. th it's okay to feel that way, we but, that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, um, you, you know, you're still valuable and your mental health and your physical health is still very important. And um, mm. if you need help, there's lots of resources out there. And I want to point out one of our, we have Dr. Gaffney on the set and I want to point out that we have dozens of veteran vet centers all over the country. I mean, there's six of them right here in the Bay Area, I think. And that the services are available that are specific to women that we have we have people available that you can reach out to and that you can ask for help and people should make use of that uh, that benefit. I, and I know that there's people on this panel without mentioning names that didn't know about the vet centers before they got here tonight. So I would encourage um, people to reach out and use the resources that are available. 
I think a lot of people minimize what their experiences were, and um, so they don't come in. There's a shame associated with it. There's a stigma. Um, I know even in the Air Force, we talked about people who went to mental health, and it wasn't always in a nice way. And so you, you're trained to think poorly of going to see mental health. Um, I think we gotta reverse that stigma before we can do much more. I think they have to know that we're there and available and it doesn't matter. Um, we can kind of talk about it and figure out where to go from here. But there are options and I didn't know that there were options when I retired. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think there was anything. And I think after 20 years, walking out the door for the last time and seeing that base behind me and being completely alone, um, I didn't know what to do. And so my initial response was I just kind of holed up in my house and it was the rainy season and I cried and I stayed there and I didn't know and I'd never been unemployed. I didn't even know what to wear to an interview. And it was really scary for me. And so the idea of us having this conversation saying it doesn't have to be scary and you're not alone and coming to the vet center doesn't mean all therapy all the time. We have yeah. other adjuncts to therapy. Yeah. Yeah, thank so, you so much. Uh, I want to say that this has been an extraordinary show with extraordinary guests Absolutely. and want to thank you all for being here. Absolutely. Next up, Dr. Shauna Springer had the chance to sit down with Nic Nicola Hall, the first woman to serve in combat operations in Afghanistan. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Nikki Hall, who served in the Army from 2000 to 2005 in the 21st MP Company Airborne. And she was the first woman, actually, to serve in combat operations in Afghanistan. Welcome to the studio, Nikki. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I was just hoping that today we could kind of talk story. And yeah. I know you've brought in some photos, yes. which we've talked about going through kind of your process from before the military um, to some of the experiences that really stand out to you mm -hmm. when you were in the service. You know, as you can tell from this picture, so basic training, my recruiter told me before I went in, the number one thing Hall is to do, keep, you know, just just make sure that you're low key, make sure nobody pays attention to you, keep under the under radar, the radar yeah. right? Right, right. And so I was like, all right, I've got it, I can do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, going into MAPS and then going into basic training, yeah. I quickly realized that that was gonna be tough. Yeah. The main reason, because my accent. Um, okay. I was very English back then. I have a pseudo-American English, sometimes Australian accent, some people think now. Okay. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, keep on the radar, but I couldn't because of my, because of my accent. So okay. we'd always have to call each other battle buddies and people would make fun of the way I said battle and yep. they still do to this day. Um, but it was in basic training where I realized my, my athletic ability was an equalizer, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. when we ran, when we had to rock, mm -hmm. when we had to do anything athletic, whether it was push-ups, um, flutter kicks, whatever you mm -hmm. could think of, that, that was all kind of too easy, yeah. um, to be honest. Um, I had trained at such a level right. that coming back, leaving college, coming into the yeah. army and training at that level, it was pretty simple. Yeah, right. But it was an equalizer for me mm. among men and women. And mm -hmm. I think something that my dual sergeants recognized immediately was that, um, mm -hmm. man, she's pretty tough, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. But not just the, the physical toughness. I mean, it's all that history, right, of yeah. training. Yeah. Would have given you a layer of kind of emotional preparation. Yeah. Can we talk about that for a second? The experience of basic for you when you're getting corrected. Yep. And shaped. Yeah. How that was given kind of your history. Yeah. So I think for me, on the mental side of it, it was something that I enjoyed mm -hmm. and I knew it was making me better. Okay. Right? Yeah. So right. we always say, you know, you kind of enjoy the suck. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Right? When we were out there, when it was, when we, we were getting disciplined, when there was like the mass punishment for something that somebody else did, yeah. I enjoyed that. That made mm -hmm. me a better person. I feel that made me mm -hmm. a better leader. I, it built empathy. It built teamwork, mm -hmm. right? I understood where it was happening. I could understand the end result. And I think mm -hmm. people that struggle in basic training have a or, or when they're in positions like that, struggle to see the big picture, yeah. right? And I think that's, you know, drawing on my past of mm -hmm. hard work pays off, strong people succeed. Yeah. Um, I brought that with me into basic training so I knew the end result. Yeah. Um, and as you can tell by my picture, I was kind of very happy being there too. So, yeah, a little yeah. cheeky. A little yeah. cheeky, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, you, I heard you got in trouble for that one. I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, well the, and truly smoked. I well and truly smoked. Yeah. 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 How dare you smile in your basic training picture? So. Yeah. And nobody else in the picture. Not is, one other is smiling. Smile. Yeah. They're all looking tough. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then, next step for you is to go on to Fort Bragg. Yeah. So what's the next transition, and how did that go? Yeah. And. You know, I want to very quickly step back to basic training because yeah. there's one incident in basic training which stuck with me. Okay. So I had very hard drill sergeants, okay. right? Um, they prided themselves back then mm -hmm. of being tough as hell, okay. you know? And so I had one specific drill sergeant. I remember we were out on our FTX, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of the culmination of your basic training. Mm -hmm. um, and he ran into our tent and woke us all up. Okay. And he said... The chopper's leaving in 10 minutes. We've got we to we we make it to the DZ. Okay. And we're all, we, you know, what's going on? Yeah. And he had simulated an experience for us of where we had to kind of rock up and down this hill, sprint up and down this hill to make this, you know, pretend exfil of a helicopter leaving a drop oh. zone. No other platoon did this, mm. right? He did it for us. And... Mm. You know, I had a overweight private on my squad, um, mm -hmm. and we were having to hump up and down the hill, and we had to go back and get him and kind of pull him up. And But it was that time he put me in charge of that squad. He put me in charge to make it to the DZ in that time. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was that exercise that instilled mm -hmm. um, kind of this this feeling, right, that I could kind of do everything, anything, and it was yeah. my... I guess it was my responsibility to be as mm -hmm. good as I could mm -hmm. for the men that were with me. Okay. Um, and it was, it's such a random incident in basic training, but still to this day, I, I kind of thank him for that exercise because yeah. it was, it was so hard at that point. Yeah. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done to run up and down huh. this very muddy hill with all your gear. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was kind of a game changer for me. And that's big picture stuff. Yeah. That's why you do all the training, right? Yeah, exactly. And there was a vote of confidence in his picking you to lead that charge. Exactly, yeah. yeah. What yeah. do you think he saw in you? Did you have any interactions with him? Was it the athleticism or other things that came out during basic? I think so. I think it was that, and plus I just wasn't phased, right? Okay. So if I was getting smoked or if I was getting punished or if I, if we were tired, I, what, I didn't yeah. complain, right? Okay. I, they probably could tell I could kind of, mm -hmm. I got it, right? And I was mm -hmm. kind of enjoying it, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So you didn't, and this is something I know about you, but yeah. I really want to emphasize it. You didn't want different standards. No, not at all. That would have been just important to you. Yeah. Like you wanted to be held to that same standard. Absolutely. And these leaders that you connected with at Fort Bragg yeah. saw you as a person, as a warrior in yeah. training. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you didn't really feel the sort of, different treatment from being a woman no. in this scenario? No. I had one of the hardest platoon sergeants. Okay. Um, and, you know, when I went to the went to the company, they were mm. like, oh, you're in that platoon with him. And so yeah. it was, I was worried, but very early on, you know, he'd always dip, have a big old chunk in and spit in my foot sometimes, you know, and, or trying to reach the trash can, you know, and he, he would he pulled me aside and he said, "You need to be able to keep up here to fit in." And he's like, "No excuses." And I appreciated that because mm -hmm. it was a motivator to me. Yep. I was like, "Absolutely, right." Mm -hmm. And so, whether it was a mandatory twelve mile, you know, twelve mile ruck, I was humping mm -hmm. eighty pounds and I was making it within two hours, right? Like everybody else, right? Whether it was the run, whether we were jumping, you know, I was jumping the full weight, I was jumping my full gear, and yep. there were no excuses. And so I was fortunate to be around a team that mm -hmm. um, allowed me, like, emphasized that, right? Yeah. They didn't look at me any differently. They didn't treat me any differently. I was just whole. For Afghanistan, the biggest part was... Um, so, you know, we're in country, and the infantry are running a number of missions across the country. Right. Um, and they're coming up against the issue that the local national women are hiding weapons, intel, even people yep. underneath, within them, underneath their clothes. Mm -hmm. And so what they needed, they needed a female to come with them to be mm -hmm. able to search them. Mm -hmm. And so um, as my first sergeant would tell me the story, they called up the MP unit there and said, I need a high-speed female to mm -hmm. come out with me on mission, somebody that will be able to keep up. Yep. And so he said, he told me, he's like, you were the only one. We immediately knew it was you. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And so when you think back of everything that had brought me up to this point, you know, yeah. all the hard work, not being treated differently, you yeah. know, led to this moment. The and background in track and field. The background, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I remember getting called over and two, um, um, two infantry um, guys walked over and said, you know, gave me a couple of pills, which were blood thinners, and said, mm -hmm. you know, we leave at, you know, 10 o'clock tonight, be mm -hmm. ready. Um, and so I packed up my ruck and mm -hmm. I went out on my first mission with the infantry. Mm -hmm. And um, my role was to go in with them mm -hmm. um, on, this, on this combat mission and go in and um, into a compound. And once we had kind of searched, I would then search the women. Yep. And on my first mission, I'm finding weapons, I'm finding passports mm -hmm. of high-value targets hidden on the women. Okay. Everything from them hanging in from their bras, from cord, under their armpits, you know, yeah. everywhere. Right. Um, and so as an MP, we are taught very early how to search people, so that was yeah. something that was yeah. something I knew how to do. Mm. Um, but because that mission was so effective and I was able to find so much yeah. stuff. Turned up a lot. Turned yeah. up a lot. They were yeah. like, we need to now bring you yeah. into our unit. You right? became an asset in that way. Exactly. I think the time for me in the military set me up. The leaders I had in the military set me up for everything that I'm doing moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's attention to detail, it's hard work ethic, you know, starting from my dad to, to yep. these men in the military. And so the stereotypes I, I see with women joining male units or the fact that men won't accept them, I am a living example of of it going right. Yeah. I experienced it going right. right. Um, and so I just, I want more of those, those yeah. stories out there because it was a, it was a moment in my life that I will never forget and I'm yeah. always thankful for. Any advice as we wrap up for women who want to go after a combat role? Yeah, do it. Yeah. Do it 100%, you know? It's, mm -hmm. um, it's something that I know when I got out, it was really hard it was a really hard decision for me to get out, mm -hmm. but those opportunities were not there for me, mm -hmm. right? Those roles weren't open to yeah. women at the time. Um, if they had been, I'd still be in uniform today. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, if you have those opportunities mm -hmm. to serve in that capacity, there are no excuses. Just do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks, Nick, for yeah. coming in. It was really thanks fun to talk me. to you. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you for tuning in to Veterans Voices tonight. We wanted to leave you with a few events and resources. As a reminder, all of these can be found on our Veterans Voices website. Foundation for Women Warriors is, is a support organization created exclusively for the women veteran community of Southern California, focused on serving their most pressing needs. Learn more at foundationforwomenwarriors.org. The National Association of Black Military Women creates and preserves the history and heritage of African-American military women, of active service members and veterans. Visit nabmw.org to learn more. The FOCUS Project provides resilience training to military children, families, and couples. It teaches practical skills to help families and couples overcome common challenges related to a military life. It helps build on current strengths and teach new strategies to enhance communication and problem solving, goal setting, and creating a shared family story. Visit them at focusproject.org. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa, so be sure to subscribe. Our next live broadcast will be Monday, May 20th at 7 p.m. Be sure to tune in. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa County signing off, wishing you all a relaxing evening, and for the veterans out there, Hoorah! 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 and Semper Fi. Good evening. <laughs>